Welcome to the Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Braden Knudsen. I'll be your host for this webinar. And we'd like to ask you to answer a couple of the polls that we have down at the bottom of the screen as we go through our announcements for today. Um, so our next webinar will be tomorrow, Wednesday, April 26th at 1.30 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Um, and that webinar will be on relationships and family search family tree and Catherine Grant will be coming back again for us tomorrow so we hope you can join us again tomorrow. That'll be a good one and uh, hopefully it'll be helpful as well. And if you have any suggestions for future webinar topics you can email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu. We have received a couple of emails um, and we will be working some of the topics that we've got suggested to us into this rotation for, um, for probably June. And so feel free to email us and we'll make sure we get those into the rotation as well. So today we'll be pleased to hear from James Tanner who will be giving a presentation titled Finding That Genealogical Gold Right Under Your Feet. James Tanner has a bachelor's degree in Spanish and a master's degree in linguistics from the University of Utah. He received a Juris Doctor degree in law at Arizona State University. He served for two years as an intelligence analyst for the U.S. Army and 39 years as an Arizona trial attorney. He has previously owned a retail computer business and an Apple Macintosh software company. James has over 35 years experience in genealogical research and is an avid blogger of Genealogy Star blog and rejoice and be exceeding glad. He served for 10 years as a missionary at the Mesa Arizona Family Search Library and is currently serving at the BYU Family History Library. He has presented at expos and conferences around the U.S. and Canada. James has seven children and 33 grandchildren. Okay, so as we get this loaded up here, we will remind you about our comments box and the questions box on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to write those in, and we'll make sure we get those answered by the end of the presentation. And we will turn the time over to James now. Howdy, this is James Tanner. I'm glad to be here for another BYU, that's Brigham Young University Family History Library webinar. And remind everyone that we uh, record these and upload them to our BYU Family History Library YouTube channel. That's youtube.com. Just do a search for BYU Family History Library. And we now have, as of the date of this particular webinar, about 262 of them up there. So there's uh, getting to be a little bit of a pile. And speaking of piles, we have this lovely pile of gold sitting here on our, on our uh, startup screen. And we're going to talk about finding the genealogical gold right under your feet. And I love to put the word gold in my titles of my blogs or, and in my uh, webinars because then everybody wants to listen to them. But um, we'll start out with a little bit of gold. Some trivia here, gold nugget. The largest gold nugget ever found was uh, called the Welcome Stranger. And uh, interesting thing about this uh, it was uh, the 12-inch bar across the bottom is, uh, is, gives you some idea of the size of this thing. And uh, the interesting thing about it, it was found, uh, it's an alluvial gold dugget. You can imagine what kind of a, of, a, of a river or stream would have to have moved that monster rock down the, down the channel. But it, that's really what it was. And it was uh, found only uh, an inch, a little over an inch under the surface of the earth. No great digging here. They just scraped away a little dirt and uh, started looking for this giant uh, gold nugget. And it was near the base of a tree on a slope. And it, that got to be known as Bulldog Gully. And it's, it weighed 3,523 and a half troy ounces. That's 109.59 uh, kilograms or 293 and a half pounds and one and a half ounce of gold. And so that was, uh, and they melted it all down and made some money off of it. Uh, we've always, always speculated that if they'd kept that gold dugget around, they probably could have made more money charging people to come and see it uh, than they, and, and whatever, than they, than they would have made uh, had they melted it down. But it was worth a lot back then, and it'd be worth whatever the price of gold is today. I should have looked that up, yeah. And uh, it would be uh, still a big, uh, quite a hunk of change there. Okay. Now, what does this have to do with genealogy? Probably nothing. But usually I can come up with a real good tie-in here. And the tie-in is, of course, that there's some of the things that we're looking for and some of the records that we're looking for are literally right beneath our feet. They're right there. And we don't 
we either haven't taken the time or don't make the effort to, to look and see what we already have. And uh, I can give some pretty good stories about this. First of all, uh, it, so this information, as I say here, can be lurking almost as close as this huge gold nugget. It could be just very, take a little bit of scraping away and we'll find what we're looking for. So I'm going to start out with a good example, and that was my grandfather's military record. Um, this is a, uh, a shot, a photo of his uh, grave marker. And the grave marker, and in fact, the, the, uh, the information that I needed was so close that I didn't even, I had no idea. It took me a long time to figure it out. So my father, my grandfather had this information here. It said Arizona, Private, 141st Infantry, 36th Division, World War I, 1895, died in, and born in 1895, died in 1944. Well, so I decided one day that I was going to do some research into his military record. And as I looked for his military record, I went into uh, what turns out to be a rather exhaustive history of all of the units that participated in World War II. And there are fact, excuse me, World War One, and there are in fact uh, databases that list nearly everybody who participated in the war. And I was drawing a blank. There was just nothing there. There was nothing that told me anything about uh, mentioned either this unit or my grandfather or anything that was going on. In other words, but I knew he had. I mean, I just knew from family tradition and the fact that we had some artifacts like his uniform and other things that he was in World War I. And in fact, he, I know he had also served on the border war with, with Mexico under Pershing. And, and uh, he had been uh, you know, down on uh, when Pancho Villa and all that in Mexico. So um, that, was the, that was kind of a big mystery. I did quite a bit of research around. And uh, then something interesting happened. Because his name didn't show up on, on, on any of the records, uh, I tried to find a, a military service record. And uh, that didn't seem to make any, any connection either. There just simply was no military service record that I was aware of or could find, um, even going into the National Archives or whatever. Where did I finally find a service record? Well, that's the basis for this whole webinar here, is that I found it in a box with, when my father passed away. There in the box was a folder, and inside that folder was my grandfather's military service record. And how it turned out that he wasn't that I couldn't find him in World War One in any of the records was that he was not a regular army office person. He had joined the National Guard in Arizona, and then in, been transferred to a Texas National Guard unit, which was mobilized during World War One. So he ended up fighting in World War One. I, I assume from because of the record of that unit, all the way up through um, from France, all the way up to ger through Germany. But we didn't have any record of that at all, nothing except I, when I did get his military papers that showed uh, where he had served and the times that he had served. Uh, this isn't unusual because it's, it's, it was, it's fairly common among uh, particularly veterans who, who were fought in combat during the wars, whether it was Korean War, World War One, World War Two, that they didn't want to talk about it, and they never did talk about it or tell anybody in their family about any of their experiences during the war. So that, that's not unusual, but the information here I found. Now, to add a little bit more to the story, that tombstone, that grave marker that I showed at the beginning, uh, was also a key, because that was a veteran's uh, grave marker. And uh, what I finally found, in fact, I found it on Ancestry.com, was uh, a copy of the application card that, that my uh, father and a few other people are related filled out to obtain a veteran's grave marker for my grandfather's grave. And conveniently, on the back of that card, of that 3 by 5 card, someone had penciled in his entire service record. So we had a summary of his entire service record, which would, of course, also been a way for me to find it. And it was uh, literally an ancestry is as close as uh, anything you can get to me because I can 
yet I've been on the program for years. So both of these uh, examples show how you can find thing, uh, things that are seem to be rather difficult and they might be resolved simply by looking at documents that you have available in, and that you may not even be aware that you have available because you haven't looked at them. So remember that valuable genealogical records could be as close as your attic or your basement. Now what if you don't have an attic or a basement? That's possible. Um, there are many places. Phoenix, for example, uh, if you live in the Salt River Valley, it's very unlikely you have a basement and it's almost impossible if you have an attic. You might have an attic, but the attic is probably uh, 120, 130 de degrees in the summer, even if it's highly insulated. So it, it's not going to be a place where you're going to use, use th put things that are perishable or that you're really concerned about. So um, this is, uh, you know, this, but this is the case that we, and I'm using uh, the, the terms attic or basement in a, in a sort of general sense of any place where your, your traditional family records may have ended up uh, as, you're, as you have lived. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't have any traditional family records. And my, my uh, answer to that has always been the same, and that is we'll get online and start asking, and you'll be surprised how much, how many different things there might be out there. We'll get to that a little bit later. So over the years, the long time that we've been working on this, uh, my family, meaning my me and uh, my some of my children, I mean my immediate family, not not my extended family, but my wife, my children, and I have inherited thousands of documents from our relatives, um, basements full of documents, literally. We have, um, I've been digitizing the records for years, and um, the last time I did a backup on my computer, I had something like one 2.2 million files, and about a few hundred thousand of those are digitized copies of records and documents and photographs. So this information has basically come flowing to us over the past years now. How does that occur? Why is that the possibility? And the answer is because we've been willing to digitize and store them. And that was the simple thing. Um, for example, uh, in teaching a class down in Mesa at the Family History Library down in Mesa, Arizona, uh, I, after a class, one of the participants of the class came up and said, you don't know me, but I'm your step cousin. And I said, well, how do you have a step cousin? And he said, well, my mother married your uncle uh, and uh, after she was, uh, already had a couple of children. And I am one of the children of your uncle as my stepfather. And I said, oh, okay. I have no idea who she was. I'd never seen her before in my life. Uh, and but after she explained who she was, and I, I I could see the connection, and I understood who the poor people were, and she said, "Well, I have all of your uncle's records and photographs. Do you want them?" And I said, "Absolutely." And she said, "Okay, you have them." And so we got boxes of albums, of photo albums, and journals, and letters, and a whole bunches of things that had been preserved through that family, through someone who was really not directly related. And uh, that was simply because I was available and I was willing to take the stuff. Now, if I'd said, no, 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 I don't have any place for it, I'm really not interested, thank you very much, then I would assume that at that point all of that information and all of those documents would have been either thrown away or never made available to the family. Now, what's happened to those documents is we have digitized them all. And we're in the process of putting all those documents up on FamilySearch.org uh, memory section. So they'll eventually be available for everyone in the extended family to access and be preserved. So to answer the question, what do we do with all these documents? And the answer is quite simple. We process them, we digitize them, and we upload them to Family Search Memories. So. Why do we choose family search memories? Well, there are a number of reasons. Number one, it's free. Number two, uh, family search is sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and it's not going anywhere. It's not going to vanish, and it's not going to go out of business. And the church itself and the members of the church have a doctrinal, scriptural reasons for doing family history. And so it's, it's not just a 
uh, an interest or a, a hobby. It is a, a religious duty on the part of members of the of the Mormon Church or the LDS Church to um, to do their genealogy, and they are involved very very seriously in uh, preserving records. Now, did I preserve the records from my great uncle uh, because uh, of some religious interest? No. It's primarily because I'm very much interested in the documents and their content. And I also, because I've been involved in genealogy for so many years, I'm just interested in seeing them preserved. I think it's a, it's a waste of, of a lot of effort that went into creating the documents to have them just thrown away, which happens quite frequently, by the way. It's not something that you can just pass off. OK, so how do we find the records? How do I know they're there? I mean, you know, if I talked to, a, if I walked out of uh, here of this webinar this afternoon and went out on into the library and talked to a few people and said, "Has anybody ever walked up to you and offered to give you a bunch of old records?" Uh, you probably find very few, very very few people that that had actually happened to. So why uh, why are we different? Why are people supplying our family with records constantly? Number one. We maintain an online presence with blogs and social media. And we make it abundantly clear in our blogs and social media that we are willing to take and preserve any records that we receive. And we, and we say that periodically. And we ask for them. Uh, in one case, for example, um, my great-grandmother was a professional photographer in the early 1900s in um, the eastern part of Arizona, in what's called Apache County, Arizona. And uh, the, I, su I surmised that she had taken uh, quite a few, maybe thousands of pictures. But the answer was, I had no access to them, and I'd never seen them, and did not know where the records had been, where the, her, her photographs had gone. And as a, base, as a, as a uh, result of that, uh, I've been talking to my daughter, who uh, who had a, a blog, one of my daughters. Uh, I said, uh, "Whatever." I'm still wondering whatever happened to Graham Overson's uh, photographs. And as as a result of that conversation, she said, "Oh well, look, I'll just put a notice in the blog, in my blog, and we'll see what happens." And I said, "That's great." Okay, well, she did that, and nothing happened. But three years later. Literally, three years later, the bog had been up online for three years, she got a phone call, and it was from a cousin. And the cousin said, I have all of the photographs. And so immediately, my daughter called me and said, call this cousin and find out. And it turned out that the cousin that I had, who had all the photographs, had them in large plastic storage containers. And they turned out to be uh, quite a large number of glass negatives and other fo and, and printed photographs, and even back to uh, tintypes and all sorts of other uh, photographic processes. And uh, that collection of, of had been passed around, and he'd been carrying that around for 30 years and had never gotten rid of it. But he was older, and not uh, he did not expect to be able to, to live too much longer. And uh, I was desperately trying to find a place for it. And his comment to me was that if I gave it to my family, they would just throw it away. Because they had no appreciation for the, for the historical importance of it. So what happened to the collection was um, it turned out to be about 4,200, between 4,200 and 4,300 different images. With um, the negatives copied, it was over 6,000 images. And so we digitized the whole thing. And uh, those, all of those photographs are going up onto the familysearch.org uh, memory section and being attached to those we can identify. And we're putting up all of them so that people who see the photos and recognize a relative can, can tag that relative. And that's been happening pretty consistently since I've started to put them up on the family search. So we always be sure to tell people we're looking for documents and photos, that we really are interested in and that we will be glad to take them. Uh, this happens all the time. And uh, uh, it, become, it has become a part of, of uh, 
a kind of an ingrained part of our family tradition that when we hear someone mention that they have a letter from one of our ancestors or they have a, a diary or a journal or whatever, the first response we have is, how can we get a copy of that? If you want to save the original, what, what can I do to help you with the original? Well, those are all the kinds of things that help people understand that we are really are interested. So after we've advertised, I mean literally advertised in our blogs and put this out on social media, then we get um, responses. So here's my daughter's blog. This is called The Ancestor Files. It's .blogspot.com. It's on Google Blogger. And uh, she is a uh, professional historian and author. And she has been maintaining this for years. And it, and it contains an amazing amount of information about our family. And most of the document, many of the documents, I wouldn't say most, but many of the documents that she's found through research, but many, many of the other documents she's found have come because people have sent them to us as a result of being on this blog and having this blog available. And from time to time, very infrequently as a matter of fact, I do contribute to this blog, but uh, I have my other blogs to, to do. And she sometimes contributes to mine also. So we're sort of all all in this together. So as a result of this, and the attitude is more important than anything else, we receive a constant stream of photos, documents, and other information. Some of these turn out to be quite controversial. And without going into that issue, we, we find uh, that there are claims made about documents that uh, sometimes put both me and my daughter into uh, sort of the uh, verification mode. And uh, we spend uh, some, we have spent considerably time uh, trying to uh, to to uh, document the authenticity of certain claimed records, and uh, and sometimes we're uh, we're unfortunately have to tell the people that or disappoint people and tell them, well, this really is not the photo that you thought it was. This is not really you and the president of the United States, your ancestor and the president of the United States together having dinner, this is really something else. You know, this is not what you think it is. Um, and it gets to be quite an interesting uh, online discussion topic for a period of time. OK, so what should you look for? What are we looking for when we're out looking for documents like this? Well, first of all, you should make uh, a very close look at the documents that you have in your own home or uh, that you, your close relatives may have. Um, People sometimes are not overly willing to let pe others look at their documents. Uh, I found that uh, uh, that may take some time, that may take some effort. And uh, in the case of some of the documents, like I mentioned earlier, when I received the, the uh, World War I military record of my grandfather, uh, I mean, I'm going to have to say I don't think my father even remembered that he had it. So even if I'd ask him about it, he probably wouldn't have said he had it. But uh, he was an attorney, as I was, and uh, he had a lot of records. And, and I don't think he even could remember what he had put in all these files and all those over that time period, over a long lifetime. First of all, I think we should look for Bible records. Now, Bible records are interesting because there has been a tradition beginning in Europe and carried over into the uh, American colonies and then later into even, pro even modern times of, uh, of having a family Bible, a, a large Bible book that's designated as uh, a family Bible. And many of these Bibles, starting way back in the 1800s um, and even earlier, had pages set aside to record special family events. And where it's in a, and in times, there were uh, those records are the only record that we may have of the birth of uh, people in a family. Uh, birth records are only uh, have only been kept for relatively uh, recent times. And Bible records are uh, sometimes the only, only evidence. And, one of my friends came to me once and asked me to help him with some research into his family. And he was only aware of his father's name, knew his mother's name, and knew some of the family members. And the only reason he knew that was because he had a photocopy of a Bible record. And that was literally his entire knowledge about his family and his genealogy. But using the Bible record, 
we were able to do some research and push that back clear into colonial times in, uh, in California when it was during the Spanish colonies and, uh, into the, and into the mission records in Southern California. So there's, uh, you know, this is, uh, don't underestimate or even, uh, even consider lightly the, the fact that a Bible record, now where do you find Bible records? Well, uh, some of them are preserved online. Uh, they're available in, uh, in some of the larger databases. And many of them are sitting in libraries and other archives across the country. Unfortunately, it may take some detective work to discover this, where this Bible record uh, ended up. Uh, if you do find a Bible record that, that uh, you go to a book, old bookstore or something, there's a Bible in there, and you thumb through it and find that it's got writing in it and it tells about a family, uh, I suggest you purchase it and make sure that it gets into a proper uh, into the proper hands. Uh, so this is a this is one of the types of records that could be, could be a very personal record, but it could be uh, one that uh, may be crucial in finding out uh, one of your ancestors. In another in another instance, uh, I had a friend that I was doing some research for in the South, and his family uh, came from uh, Mississippi, Itawamba County. I don't know how they say it down there, but that's how I said it. And uh, uh, by the way, that it was pretty difficult. And the only way that I cracked going east and finding out where these people came from was to find a Bible record that happened to be on Ancestry. And it wasn't on Ancestry as a source. It wasn't something that I searched for and found. It was attached as a photo to one of the ancestors. And that Bible record that was attached as a photo was the key to identifying and, and finding out where this family had come from. I traced them, them from, from uh, Mississippi uh, in, across Alabama into, um, into Georgia and then up into, into North Carolina. So basically that was the key, the Bible record that uh, was found. Okay, so what else should I look for? If I'm going to go out and look for stuff for my family, I should look for diaries. Um, diaries, uh, from my, in my experience, are um, sometimes helpful and sometimes amusing and sometimes thought-provoking and sometimes extremely uh, uh, inspiring and, and uh, emotional things. But um, this may be the only, th only record you have of certain things that happen in your ancestor's life. And we're seeing here in a, a kind of a photo of a representation of a diary looking like a bound book with, a, uh, you know, with even a book marker in it, uh, bound and looking beautiful. Uh, I have found diaries on, on spiral, in spiral notebooks. I have found them on, uh, on pieces of mismatched paper. I have found them in all sorts of different, uh, different types of diaries. And um, these basically are, are found because you're constantly asking people for uh, their records and, uh, and asking to be able to preserve them if they will allow you to have them. If not, uh, you uh, take pictures and preserve them on the spot uh, with the expectation that you may never see that document again. So these are, these are important documents. Now, here's the important factor, of course, is they'll take some searching. They're not something that's just laying out there on the counter for you to pick up. Sometimes you have to ask, and sometimes you have to ask multiple times and in different ways in order for them to part with the information. Or maybe they don't remember that they have the diary. Uh, maybe it's in a box in the basement, uh, and uh, they haven't even looked at the box in 20 or 30 years, or never looked at it. When they got it from their other rel from another relative, they stick simply stuck it in the basement. One of the biggest record collections that I received um, ended up being thousands and thousands of records. Of uh, the total number of people that we ex that I extracted from the records was about 16,000 people, and it had been accumulated by my great grandmother over 30 years. And the records had disappeared. No one knew where they were. I'd asked the question about where they were probably 50 times because I kept hearing 
the story about how much genealogy she'd done, but nobody had the records and nobody seemed to be able to tell me where they were. Well, they ended up being in one of my aunt's basements and she knew, she didn't even, she only vaguely knew that they were there, but in trying to clean the basement, decided to throw them all away and would have had my mother not, not agreed to talk to me and I would not agree to take the, the records because she was not interested in them, in them at all. And it was a, three large boxes. Actually, it was four boxes to start out with, but it was condensed down to three large boxes, like banker boxes, full of records, including original letters, diaries, um, original documents, and all sorts of things that were of, of extreme value to the family. What happened to that collection? That collection got completely digitized, and the original documents are now in the BYU Harold Beely Library, L. Tom Perry Special Collections Library here on campus. And the uh, copies of those are available on uh, CDs on the computers in the Family History Library in Salt Lake. So these documents have been well preserved and they're now available uh, to, uh, to, to researchers. That isn't going to happen with all the documents, by the way. And, and one, of the, one of the big problems is putting a value on old genealogy documents as far as the family is concerned or as far as the people who are involved are concerned. Uh, that's one of the biggest problems is that uh, historically what happens is the genealogists are very um, possessive people. Uh, once they've done all this work, they own it, they, they want to keep it, and they don't want anybody else messing with it. And that's kind of the attitude that's been uh, kind of created by the, by the isolation that, the, that many genealogists feel. Well, in that, in that isolation, they basically, uh, none of their immediate family uh, many times don't appreciate the value of what they have because they are not genealogists and they, in a sense, many times resent the fact that their mother, aunt, grandmother, whoever has spent all this time doing something that they don't have any relationship with, any, any way to, to measure the value. And so basically what happens is the people die and the records get lost, thrown away, or destroyed. And that happens uh, just, uh, I mean, just consistently. I, we hear about it, uh, not not every day. It's not something that happens every day, but it, but regularly, I have people come up and tell me stories about documents that were that were lost. And we then we're trying to do is is stem that tide and try and capture some of those documents that um, otherwise would have disappeared around the world. So what else should I look for? Journals. How do we determine, what's the difference between a journal and a diary? Well, a journal is like writing a book, a story about yourself, and a diary is, is more in the nature of what I did every day or how I felt today. Or, you know, The diaries that I've seen uh, will have an entry like, got up and went to work. Now, that's really helpful. I mean, it's inspiring and all that, but you know, the fact that they got up and went to work, that's not, everybody does that, you know? But uh, when you have 15 entries in a row that says that, then you know it's a diary. Uh, but if it's a journal, it'll usually have more information in a narrative format. And that's kind of the distinction. They're really about the same thing, but, it, but uh, we think of journals being uh, more creative and having more uh, uh, narrative and more stories and things like that. And many of the journals that I've read and we've acquired have been uh, you know, really, really interesting stories. Now, journals and diaries, by the way, are something that uh, that pe that organizations like Family Search and the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, and uh, the BYU Special Collections Library, are are in other words, they're something they will consider putting in their collection. And I can't say they'd take every diary and every journal, but uh, if the diary journal falls into the category of the types of, of records that they're interested in then they will preserve them. And a lot of times they will digitize them. And many times if you have a diary and you want, or a journal, and you want to have it preserved, you can give it to the Family History Library and they will digitize it and put it online in the, in the FamilySearch.org books part, books section of the FamilySearch.org website. And all I can say about journals is they can be in really surprising locations. You just never know when they're going to turn up, who's going to have it, and where it ended up. 
these. Now, if you want to look for one of these, and, and so I mentioned that that's where they would take them, then, then you need to understand that there are places online where, where this information has now becoming uh, very available. The, the Family History uh, book section of uh, FamilySearch.org, the online website, this is a free website, has um, approximately now about 360,000 uh, fully digitized and readable, meaning they've all had optical character recognition and are readable, uh, genealogically related documents, including journals and diaries and uh, surname books and all sorts of other materials. So um, when I did this, this the number goes up at about 1,000 a week. Um, and we do these, uh, uh, the, the slide presentation, the, the presentations usually a few weeks in advance. So sometimes my numbers are kind of, uh, they may be low. I really don't ever try to overestimate it, but, I, but I'm often below the actual number. And, and since they've been doing 1,000 a week about of adding journals, diaries, and family and local and state histories uh, into the uh, familysearch.org website, then that number will go up every week. Okay, so what else can I find? What else is out there that I might look for? First of all, letters. A lot of people have kept letter collections. Uh, letters have become something of, of fairly substantial interest uh, from, from a literary standpoint. Uh, it's, there was one, uh, I recall, one collection of letters that was discovered of a, from a soldier during the Civil War and it was particularly uh, emotional and interesting and uh, was made quite a bit of news when it was published uh, because of, the, uh, because of the, the relationship that he had with his wife and, and, the, and the letters that he had written home during the war. And Of course, uh, in, th in this kind of situation, it always seems that the person gets killed in the war and all that, so it's always a tragedy. But Anyway, the, the letters themselves are valuable uh, genealogical uh, artifacts. And uh, the, the, I guess in some cases, and assuming you uh, uh, inherit a huge amount of paper from someone, uh, the, answer, the, the question you often ask is, how much of this stuff is worth preserving? What is it that we want and that we're interested in? So you can look around in your attics, your basements, trunks, boxes, drawers. There may be any place. Uh, there's no, no, you know, find it. Then when you find uh, the paper, then the, then the question always comes up as to its value. Is it worth preserving? Is it worth my time to copy this? Now, understanding that many people out there will say, no, it's not worth anything. I'm going to throw it all away. Why do I want to keep a bunch of old papers? And uh, that's been the attitude of many people, and that's the reason why a lot of the stuff uh, that has, you know, a lot of these letters and diaries and things have been lost over the years. People who recognize that it's its value are more likely to keep it. Now, there's a fine line between recognizing the value of documents that have been preserved and being a hoarder. Uh, and so keeping, you know, uh, store receipts and junk mail and... Uh, programs from every type of organization that don't even mention anybody in the family or things like that, that, that you know, there's kind of a line there. You have to, uh, uh, it, just because somebody has a huge stack of newspapers does not mean that that's valuable. It's, uh, there's something out there that you have to, to be realistic and understand which of these documents may or may not uh, allow you to, you know, are worth preserving and taking your time with. And, and here's the rule I have, and that is be there first when the relative passes away. Get an understanding before the, before the old person passes on that uh, we, we actually want to preserve this stuff. And even if you don't think it's worth anything, we do, and we would be glad to go in and, and get that information. So that may sound a little like a vulture, but uh, in a sense, what you are are genealogical vultures. But you're not going to eat the stuff. You're actually going to preserve it. Okay, so what else can I find if I'm out there looking for uh, genealogical gold scrapbooks? Um, 
and from my perspective, a lot of times uh, scrapbooking, as it's been kind of evolved over the years, uh, it was a fad. Uh, I don't know if it's actually passed into you know oblivion yet. I think there's still big scrapbooking conventions and whatever. Um, there's some good things about the way that it's preserved, but in other cases, uh, like when they uh, chop pictures up and put things in, uh, you know, just to make them look pretty, that that isn't necessarily helpful to archiving and preserving the history of the documents that are that are included. So, uh, scrapbooking is good, and many times uh, we have uh, inherited. Uh, a few dozen, I think, scrapbooks. Um, if I think back, uh, I had my father did a military scrapbook, and we have all sorts of other scrapbooks that we've had out there that we've had that could, uh, these could be anywhere. I mean, scrapbooks can turn up uh, almost any place. Um, I can remember several times when we've been at a, at a relative's house and they say, oh, I have this old scrapbook from your grandfather or your great-grandfather. Would you like to see it? I say, yes, we did. But what we would like more is to be right here taking pictures of it. And uh, when you get into that mode, uh, you're carrying a camera. And in my case, I uh, probably carry a camera uh, almost as much time as I'm up and out around the house. And I always have one around the house. So uh, we're always ready to go out. And I can remember standing out on people's porches to get some light and taking pictures while my wife turned the pages of the scrapbooks. Okay, so what else can I find? What else is out there that, that I might want to look for? Uh, photographs, prime example. You can have them in albums, or they might just be loose in a box or in a drawer. Uh, sometimes they're in uh, really, really bad condition, and sometimes they're, they've been well-preserved. Uh, Photographs, old photographs are uh, a lot more stable than photographs taken since around the 1950s. Most of the ink, uh, the dyes and ink that were used in photographs uh, after, especially slide photographs, like 35 millimeter slides and things like that, they generally were unstable. And so what you're going to see from your childhood, if you have child, and they weren't photos in black and white on, uh, on high grade paper, is probably they've either faded or that there's been substantial color changes. Uh, 35 millimeter slides are just notorious for this, and it's very important that we that you um, uh, digitize these items. Uh, now, a facility like the BYU Library, we're here, has uh, a bank of scanners, including negative scanners and uh, uh, multiple page scanners and book scanners, which are open for uh, researchers and, and genealogists to come in and use uh, for free. And, uh, and people, a constant stream of people in here with boxes and suitcases and trunks full of, of, uh, of pictures and slides uh, doing, uh, spending a few days scanning a huge collections, which I have done myself. I've come in here with a couple of thousand uh, photos to scan. So again, we're looking in attics, basements, trunks, boxes, drawers, any place where the photos might have been stored, uh, squirreled away, uh, and, uh, f and finding those. Now, the key here with photographs is that uh, there could be a lot of people you just look like you can't, you have no idea who these people are. And here's a box of, of, of photographs in, in relatively good condition from a great grandparent or whatever, and you have no idea how you're related or who these people are. The, the idea here is that as soon as possible, try to have older relatives identify the people as, as soon as you can. And that can be uh, either a very uh, difficult or, or a very enjoyable experience. Uh, in some of my cases, in trying to get my older relatives, they didn't want to talk about it. They were, uh, you know, they, either they had some undisclosed issues with their relatives or whatever, or they just didn't want to go back over those memories. And uh, that was difficult. But in a lot of cases, we've, we've been able to find relatives who are able to um, identify uh, some, maybe not all, but some of the, of the people in certain photographs. And then again, like I mentioned earlier, if we put them on, up online and allow people free access, like we have on FamilySearch Memories, 
which is, by the way, searchable by Google, uh, they will show up as images. And when they're when they go on Family Search, anyone who goes on the Family Search uh, can go in there and tag the images and attach them to their relatives in uh, in Family Search. So now that we've thought about photographs, what else are we going to talk about? Well, certificates. Um, A lot of people have saved all the certificates and awards and other things from their childhood. And uh, sometimes when you get older, you decide, well, what am I keeping all this for? I'm very tired of having this stuff around, and it's time to throw it away. The answer is try to find someone, or if you are that someone, try to find those people before they throw the things in the garbage and, and tell people that you're willing to take them and, and acquire them. Uh, certificates are important because they establish not just a specific date, but they also s establish a specific time uh, when uh, and a place when an event occurred. So uh, a certificate is important, uh, particularly uh, we think of baptismal certificates or, or uh, graduation certificates or uh, discharge from the army or whatever. All of those types of documents are, are very important because what they will do is locate your, your person in a specific point in time and at a specific place and that helps you to find additional records. So these are, are very valuable. So I keep saying look in all the same places, that means uh, that they could be literally anywhere in a, in a person's house or in documents, storage where storage uh, sheds, storage documents, basements, attics, um, any place where people keep their piles of stuff that they don't th seem to throw away. And the key here, once again, is get to them before they're thrown into the dumpster or garbage can or whatever. At this point, it's important to remember not to forget oral histories. Now, we may not think of an oral history as a document or something that we can preserve, but this is, these are extremely important. And once again, these can be preserved online. Uh, we have some national uh, oral history organizations like uh, the Library of Congress and Smithsonian, and they have been out uh, actively recording oral histories and, and uh, across the country for many years. But this can be done on a local level, and in some cases there are uh, libraries and other archives that will take oral histories. Uh, when I came to Provo, I moved into an area where there were a lot of retired professors, and it occurred to me that we should start preserving their oral histories. And as a result, I have I've done a number of these oral histories, and uh, those histories are now being archived in the BYU L. Tom Perry Special Collections Library here on campus, uh, right downstairs. In fact, we're sitting in the room right over the top of the L. Tom Perry Special Collections Library. So uh, most of the library, by the way, this is kind of an insight as to where we're, where we're talking from. We're underground here. We're uh, on the first floor down from ground level, and the library, uh, the rest of the library is down another floor beneath us, deep under the ground. And uh, the whole library, uh, probably uh, more than half of the entire library is underground. So we, we've got, uh, it's a quite a large library, but it doesn't appear to be in a very large building. That's because you're walking on it. <laughs> it's underneath all of the plazas and everything. For personal family histories and oral histories, uh, this little kind of object here is, is indispensable. This is a, uh, this brand happens to be a Sony. There's others that, many different brands out there. But this is a digital recorder. This little item here is about the size of, well, it's smaller than a cell phone and a little bit thicker. And basically what it is is a, a digital recorder. Uh, the built-in memory on this will record about 40 to 50 hours of recording. And uh, if you put an SD card in it, that'll kick that up to a couple of hundred, three or four hundred hours of recording, maybe 500. Uh, you can get high high density SD cards now, and, and and so you could put a and then those SD cards can be switched out. So technically, you have uh, unlimited ability to record. Um, 
and uh, they're very unobtrusive. You can buy these. Uh, they're running right now between $50 and $60 on Amazon. And you can plug in an external mic, a little tiny clip-on mic. And I've found that's useful for just putting it on a table next to the person or on the chair. They're amazingly uh, sensitive. Uh, and uh, the, the, the sound quality is, is, is excellent. And uh, what happens with these is that people seem to forget they're there. And they just talk. And it turns out to, you get some amazing interviews by doing that. And so this is a one way I would strongly suggest that people get involved with uh, preserving their, their family resources. Now, what if you don't know what to do with the stuff um, and uh, you're, you're you know, just kind of at odds, you've got big piles of stuff sitting around and you're not sure how you used to go about preserving it. Well, the resource and the basic resource I found for, for preservation is the Preservation Directorate from the Library of Congress. Their law, their, uh, their law, the uh, website is loc.gov, loc and uh, it's slash forward slash preservation forward slash. And if you put that in, loc.gov slash preservation, this page comes up, and this, uh, if you try to just go to loc.gov, the, the main website, you're going to have to search for preservation and then get to the place because it's, there's no links on the front page anymore. Used to be right there on the on the on the startup page for the Library of Congress website. Now they've got a lot of pretty pictures and stuff, but no links out to anything that's on the website, which makes it really difficult. But so what you're going to have to do here is uh, go look for government, Library of Congress preservation, page will come right up. And on that page, you will have uh, collections cares. So there's a list there of different types of, of items that you might want to preserve. And uh, that list is paper, books, photographs, scrapbooks, albums, newspapers, and more comic books are on the list. Uh, you know, there's lots of things on there perhaps that aren't central to, to genealogy. But here you have a detailed description from the Library of Congress of how to preserve paper records, how to preserve books, how to preserve photographs, and everything. Everything listed here tells you the, the, the minimum ways to preserve it, uh, what would be, how it would be preserved in an archive, and uh, the types of things that you can do to, uh, to make sure that you're not doing more damage than good when you're trying to take care of and, and uh, save your documents. So this is, and uh, in addition to that, they have links out to dozens and dozens of other sites, uh, websites out there on, with preservation uh, information and uh, archi archive information and everything else. This is kind of the central place to go to start to get information about record preservation. Now, if you were looking for oral history, uh, I mentioned the Smithsonian was one of the, one of the institutions that was involved in, in uh, preserving oral histories, uh, along with the Library of Congress and some of the other uh, institutions out there. Uh, they have, uh, the Smithsonian has a, a, a book an, a, it's a short little uh, pamphlet type book. It's called the Smithsonian Folk Life and Oral History Interviewing Guide. It gives you some ideas about how to interview. And uh, basically, there are two uh, kind of opposing poles in the, in the oral history world. Um, there are people who are doing research in uh, quotation marks, and they are uh, attempting to get evidence quotation marks, uh, that about information. And so they're out there interviewing the survivors of the war or interviewing someone who's, uh, you know, marching in the street or interviewing uh, people who have all sorts of different um, uh, things that they're trying to preserve. Well, uh, that's different than, than a genealogical oral history. Uh, basically, uh, if you're starting an oral history, uh, people think in terms of a long series of questions. What did you do in school? What did you do when you were in high school? What did you do when you got in the army? What did you do? And the answer to that is those are, are what are called closed-end questions. If you ask someone that type of question, 
uh, you're 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 in. They you've, st you've ended the story. They're not going to tell you anything, literally. Uh, if they like to talk, they might. Uh, the best way to start an interview for genealogical purposes, and this is my opinion, and you can, there are those who differ. Uh, plenty of people out there giving you oral history outlines, and uh, my 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 uh, best uh, stories and best uh, history, uh, interviews I've ever gotten is just by going in and say, "Tell me about yourself." It's just like that. And they sit there and look at me and say, well, what do you want to know? I say, well, uh, what do you remember from which some of your earliest memories? And that starts talking, and you just don't say anything. And by the time they finish talking, you've heard a lot of stories and a lot of interesting things. And those are the kinds of things a lot of times that we want to preserve, the dates, the names, where they went to school, what kind of degrees they got. That's the kind of stuff you can document. But the oral history, the stories, the, what, how they felt about things, when they first went to school, what kind of friends they had, where did they live, you know, were they rich, were they poor, what did they do? Those are the kinds of things we don't know about and, and we're not going to get by looking at traditional genealogical records. So that's the important thing. Okay, so what's the summary here? The summary is this. First of all, keep alert for opportunities to discover documents. Uh, ask questions. Keep uh, an open mind to get and as much information as you can from the records. Okay. Um, oh, how much does the Sony? How much does it cost? Well, let me look on it. I've got a question here. I'll stop for a second and take the question. Um, how much does it cost? They run between fifty and sixty dollars. I think they used to be like forty nine ninety five. They have a newer version, and it's like fifty six dollars. Um, and they don't. They, you don't have to buy anything else. It comes with the cable and everything to hook it up to your computer. Oh, and I forgot to mention, they create MP3 files, which are standard audio files. So when you plug that little device into your computer, it looks just like a, a, a hard drive, and you can copy off all the, the files and rename them, and, and then they can play on any CD or be transferred to uh, sent by email or anything you want to send them to. They're just a standard audio file. Okay. So back, because I hope that helps. Um, you go to Amazon and look, and they'll get to, you know, look for Sony digital recorders. Um, you can spend, by the way, three and four hundred dollars. You don't get any more. Most of what happens when you get into the higher end digital recorders is you get the ability to do uh, dictation like you would in an office. They'll give you a foot control and things like that for transcribing and, and doing dictation, and that's not what we're trying to do here with this kind of recorder. But you can get into that higher end if you want to and have the money. Okay, so if you're alert for opportunities, you're going to find things. The next, uh, the next, uh, oops, it looks like I got to click a button here. There we go. Uh, always ask questions. Uh, always assume that they might have something that's of interest or value to you. Uh, we visited people in their homes, we visited people in, in care centers, we visited people all the time, and we just kind of get into conversation and well, do you have any old photographs? Uh, do you have any of these letters that, you know, and stories? And, and, the, and the answer is usually yes, and usually if we talk about it, someone in the family is interested enough, or we are, in getting that information preserved. And then always make yourself available to store and preserve the documents. This, this requires a total mind change, mindset change. Because people in, in our world today are in the throw it away, live as simply as possible, you know, an apple in a cave uh, kind of thing, rather than, than having all this stuff around. And you really have to get yourself into the mode of being a genealogist, which means that you're going to have a bunch of paper sitting around all the time. Be optimistic. That goes without saying. Be online and ask for documents. I think that's very important today. That if you if you're online and you're you're constantly talking about coming and and wanting people to give you documents as we are constantly, then we are uh, then we get the documents. We get lots of things from contacts around. One more question. Yeah, Lynn Brown. She asks, once you have digitized your records, what do you do with all the paper records? You keep them. 
that's what I'm saying. You have to be re you have to be willing to to keep them. Now there's a there's a there's some ideas. Some people always have an idea. We have a lot of people walk into family history centers and start um, uh, and, and ask if we would take all their documents. Well, family history centers do not have facilities for storing and and receiving documents. Uh, you're you're better with historical societies, libraries, archives, uh, other other institutions that are actually involved. If it's just your family and your guy was you know, your relatives were neither rich nor famous. Uh, there's not going to be a, a, a really a big market for that. That's why we're saying that the genealogists need to be proactive to preserve records. Uh, our li anyone, anyone's life, no matter how obscure in our society, is of great value to a genealogist. And so we would just like to have that preserved. And family search memories, by the way, once the documents are, dis are digitized, is like black hole of, of information. You can just keep putting up stuff there. You can keep loading documents in there. And, uh, uh, you know, there are some, some pretty pretty strict re restrictions on the types of documents that they will take, but they will usually take just about anything. There are a limit to the number of documents that you can load in for any one individual in, in, in different categories. So you have to kind of be aware of the restrictions there. But Usually those limits are a lot higher than most people have ever ever acquired documents for one individual. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. And uh, we're here at BYU with these webinars, and remind you that they're recorded and put up on the BYU YouTube channel. Uh, we'd love to uh, have you go to the YouTube channel and subscribe. Uh, we have, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, well over 200 videos up to 262 as of today and uh, we'll go up again with this one and the rest of them that have been recorded this week so thank you for watching okay well thank you very much james for the wonderful webinar we hope you have been able to get a lot of information from this um, if there's anything you missed feel free to come back and watch the recording if you didn't get a chance to answer the polls that we had down at the bottom at the beginning of the webinar um, please take some time to do so now also if you have any feedback um, let us know, and we'd love to we'd love to have information to help us improve our webinars here. Um, we thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you next time.